Well, hello. Welcome back to Come Follow Me with Fair Faithful Answers to New Testament Questions. Not in our fancy new studio today. I'm at home. Technical problems in the studio. The upside is there are cats afoot. So cat fans, you get to see some cats today. I don't know. Uh, today, we have a fantastic topic. I say that every week, but this week it is very true. We're going to talk about Heavenly Mother. As you know, we are going through the Come Follow Me readings and addressing some common questions or differences that might come up um, between you and your evangelical friends or family. Certainly not trying to teach you how to like win a debate with them or clobber them on the head, but I am trying to help you see how um, and why they think the things that they do so that you might be able to have a better conversation with them and share some of the things from your faith in a way that they can actually hear better. Before we get started, I want to let you know about this very cool event coming up. Every year, FAIR hosts the most fantastic three-day party. Now, when I say party, what I mean is getting to listen to and interact with the best scholars and smartest people in our church. That's a party to me. Um, they give talks on what they've been working on this year. Um, and, and frequently, the FAIR conference is the first place their ideas are being presented in public. It is my kind of party. It might be yours, too. This year, the FAIR conference is um, August 2 through 4. That's a Wednesday to Friday. Um, it's held at the Experience Event Center in Provo, Utah. You can buy tickets online. Um, you can attend in person. You can attend online, fairlatterdaysaints.org. You can get tickets. Uh, maybe we can link that somewhere. I don't know. Um, I will be there all three days. I would be happy to meet you. I am presenting on one of those days. I don't know which one yet. I'll let you know when I find out. I want to tell you about two of the talks that I am very much looking forward to listening to, though. One of them is Michael Brent Collings. He's an American horror novelist, right? This is so far out of my genre. He is going to be giving a talk titled Horror, the Genre of Goodness, Godliness, and Hope. Because horror is not my deal. I, I couldn't even name horror movies because I don't watch them. But I am completely intrigued by what he's going to say. Right? He writes horror novels and somehow... He's conceptualizing this, this genre with goodness, godliness, and, and hope. Like, what? So I'm definitely looking forward to his. Another one I'm really looking forward to is Janice Johnson. Her specialty is religious history. And she's going to be speaking on the Mountain Meadows Massacre. I am really, really looking forward to what she has to say. I'm going to try to highlight some of the talks every couple of weeks here. If you enjoy sitting around listening to me, you probably would enjoy sitting around listening to my friends too. Um, it's a it's a great fun party. I love it. Okay, back to our scriptures. <laughs> our scripture this week comes from Luke chapter thirteen, verse thirty four, and we get, "O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often." But I have gathered the children together as a hen gather, gathers her brood under her wings, but you would not. So here we have God compared to a mother hen. The traditional way that evangelicals have a conversation around something like this is, yes, God is compared to a female chicken, a hen. But this verse does not require us to believe that God is female any more than it requires us to believe that God is a cosmic chicken, right? Fair enough. No one is asserting that God is a great chicken as far as I'm aware. And for a long time, this was the boundary on thinking about God and gender for evangelicals. God is male. Um, and images in the scripture that refer to God as female, such as a hen, a woman looking for her lost coin, a woman in labor, a nursing mother, a mother bear, a mother eagle. 
These were just poetic images and not to be taken too seriously. But interestingly enough, the boundary has changed quite a bit on that, even in the last 10 years, certainly in the last 20 years. It used to be that if you wanted to talk about any kind of feminine identity for God, you were being scandalous. Only the most liberal of the evangelicals would be talking about this. Um, and that is how it was for a long time. Last year, uh, one of the one of the publishing houses that publishes, I wouldn't say they are evangelical, but they do publish a lot of books that evangelicals read called Erdsman. Aird, they published two books on this topic. Two books, like it used to be you couldn't even talk about this. Last year, there were two books published mostly for evangelicals on it. If you're not familiar with the evangelical publishing world, Edmonds, they, like they're willing to push the boundaries. That's been true for a long time. They're not Zondervan. They're not Lifeway. Um, both of those are going to take an absolutely traditional evangelical line. It, they're not pushing any boundaries whatsoever. And to my knowledge, they wouldn't publish and haven't published something like this. But maybe in 10 years, they, they would if that's how things are going. Um, at any rate, it's a really big step forward that, that this is even being talked about. So the traditional evangelical view, it's actually not that interesting to look at or talk about. It's God is male, end of story, period. What else is, what else is there to say? So I'm not actually going to spend all that much time on the, on the traditional view. But I do want to talk about the direction that the evangelical world is headed on this topic even if all of them aren't there yet. And that direction is kind of two paths or two different flavors. And in order to get to what those paths or those flavors are, I actually want to summarize two different books and, and look at the reception that they received. And I think you'll see some of the, the things that are allowed in the evangelical world and some of the things that are not. The line has moved, but hasn't moved all that much. And then after that, we'll talk about the Latter-day Saint view and, and compare the two. So the first book, it's called Women and the Gender of God. It's by Dr. Amy Peeler. Um, she is a professor at Wheaton College. They like to say Wheaton College is the Harvard of the evangelical world. It's probably closer to the BYU of the evangelical world that gives you the right kind of taste of it. Um, Peeler's PhD is from Princeton, though, and she's very well liked in the evangelical world. The biggest point in her book that she is trying to make is that, yes, Jesus Christ was male, but he was born of a woman. Right? His flesh does not exist without her flesh. And, and what she's doing is she's actually modernizing an argument that was first made by Augustine. What, the way he puts it is, um, Jesus was born of a woman, but don't despair, men. Christ was happy to be a man, but don't despair, women. But don't despair, woman. Christ was happy to be born of a woman. And and her book has been pretty well received by evangelicals. She's trying to tie male and female together, that they need each other, that God relied on the the body of a woman to to bring Christ into the world. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be looked down on in the sense one of the evangelical worries is if God is male, male is God, right? Like if we only see God as a man, then what, if, what does that mean for how we see women? Um, as Latter-day Saints, you might sort of be like tilting your head at all of this and think, well, golly, that, that's a awful long path to just connect two points that are pretty easy to connect. Why not just say we have a heavenly mother? Evangelicals can't get there. You can see them longing to. Peeler is brilliant, and she works hard in this book to make people see the connections to the idea that God does not rely solely on being male. But it's an incredible amount of effort to get far less 
traction than a Latter-day Saint gets when they talk about Heavenly Mother. But Peeler's book demonstrates the idea that the boundary on this topic has in fact moved, even if it hasn't moved like all that much. In contrast, there's another book that shows pushing the line too far will still get you a slap on the hand in the evangelical world. This book is called If a God Is. It's by Mallory Wycroft. Um, it's fascinating, and but most evangelicals reject it, or at least the ones who are talking about it are rejecting it. I think it has not been nearly as well read as Peeler's book. Um, and to be fair, Wycroft does not have the same kind of educational background that Peeler does. So her work is automatically going to be something quite different. And, and that's okay. I don't think that's why she's getting rejected. Here's what she does in the book. She takes the idea that God is not merely male and expands on it using a kind of, it's kind of a panentheism that says, because God resides in us, we are God. So if God resides in a woman, then God is a woman. And that line is just, it, that is just too far for evangelicals. They cannot go there. When you read some of the evangelical criticisms of her book, what you see is it, sort of a modernization of G.K. G. Chesterson, Chesterson He's a contemporary, or maybe actually a little bit before C.S. Lewis. Um, Chesterson is kind of one of the patron saints of the evangelical world. And he once said, while talking about this idea, that if a man leans too heavily on the idea that God is part of him and not also something quite different from him, then he ends up worshiping himself, not God. And and sort of what is happening in, in this book, it, it's it's too far. They can't go there. You can see from these two examples, though, that evangelicals are very much grappling with ideas about God and gender. And you can also see they're in a muddle that it's hard to find a way out of. Um, I'll I'll point out one other evangelical take on this issue. If you watched um, the episode of this show called Certain Women, it's an episode from a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe, maybe four weeks ago. Um, you heard me talk about women in leadership or ordained ministry for evangelicals. An interesting little piece of theology pops up right here for them, at least for the evangelicals who ordain women. In the past, the evangelical position on ordination of women, it really got summed up in something C.S. Lewis said, which was something like, a woman can't be ordained because it would confuse the people into thinking that she represents God and God is not female, right? Interestingly enough, one of the modern day reasons why some evangelicals do ordain women is so that their members in their congregation can experience what it is like to see the feminine side of divinity. They can't, they can't make the jump to there must be a heavenly mother. I know, I know. Latter-day Saints, you're sitting here thinking that's the logical, that's the logical place for this to go. That's a brick wall for them. They can't. They can't. They can say something like this. All humans are created in God's image, in God's image. Therefore, God must contain within himself both feminine and masculine. So when a woman is ordained so that the congregation can experience a feminine um, divine presence through her, they're trying to get to the idea of a heavenly mother without ever actually having to get there. Um, interestingly enough, in our Latter-day Saint church, we don't ordain women. And if you look at it through this lens, we don't need to, right? If they're ordaining women because they want to see, how do you see God rule a woman? Um, 
we, we solve that problem a, a different way. We have a heavenly mother. So the takeaway here is that your evangelical friends or family they're, are probably more interested in this topic than you might think. If you want to know um, my first take on hearing about Heavenly Mother, I talked about that in the Certain Women episode. You might find that fascinating. I was shocked, to say the least. Let's talk about the Latter-day Saint view. So this is tricky territory. Let's just acknowledge that. My sense is that 30 years ago, there would be very few people openly talking about this doctrine and for some very understandable reasons. So things have shifted for us too over the years. Like I'm here talking about this in a, in a public forum and probably very few people would criticize me for that. There might, there might still be some who say like, gosh, you know, gosh, you said too much. Um, this wasn't acceptable 30 years ago. Today, today it probably mostly is. So there, there's a resource that you should know about if you don't. A lot of times what we think in, in our church, our Latter-day Saint church, is here's the doctrine as we understand it today, and it's never been said a different way. The language has always been the same around it. People have always talked the same way around it. When in reality, the same doctrine is presented in different ways, in different eras, different contexts, different cultures. That's just, this is part of what history does, right? So if you want to understand how that develops in our Latter-day Saint Church, you need to know about the BYU Scripture Index. It's an online site, search it up. Uh, I think it's um, scriptures.bdu.edu. And what you can do is you can search general conference talks all the way back to 1830. You can also search um, teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. You also can search the journal of discourses, which is a very tricky reference to wade through. You have to know what you're looking at with that one. Every wild and crazy quote you've ever seen taken out of context probably came out of the journal of discourses like you, people mishandle that one a lot but it's there and you can search it um so you can search for certain words or phrases and see how they've been used over time little pro tip you also probably have to do a little research on the historic phrasing of certain words for example if you search for heavenly mother you are only going to find references going back to the 1970s. But that's because before then, she was referred to as Mother in Heaven, not Heavenly Mother. It's just, it's a wording change, right? There's no doctrine change there. Um, for whatever reason, to modern ears, Heavenly Mother just works better. Um, so anyway, if you look on the BYU Index and research Heavenly Mother, you will find several talks from the last 20 years, a couple in the 80s, a couple in the 90s, a couple of, there's even some in the 70s, there's one in the 40s, um, there's one in like 1880 or something like that. You search for Mother in Heaven, you get a little bit broader. Um, but there have been more things said outside of conference as well. The best roundup of those, to my knowledge, um, at least on this topic, Heavenly Mother was presented in a BYU studies paper in 2011 called A Mother There. David Polson um, is the is the main author on that, and he is a student or yeah, maybe a grad student who was helping him on it. It's a long paper; it's like 30 pages long, but they do a great job tracing the teaching through history of of what has our church said about this. If you want the shortcut version of that. Um, the talk from Elder Renland a couple of years ago titled, titled Your Divine Nature and Eternal Destiny. Um, he sums it all up very well. And we have our own tension of what can and cannot be said in our church about Heavenly Mother. There are people 
who I like and respect who are extremely frustrated that more isn't said about Heavenly Mother. And I sympathize. The interesting thing, though, is think about how the evangelicals are are trying to get at this concept and they do it in all of these like sideways ways. It's the same longing and, and they end up ju just in some, some really weird spots because they can't talk about it at all. So in comparison, in our church, we have a wealth of knowledge. Like we have the phrase heavenly mother, which they don't even have that phrase. In the evangelical world, the tension is mostly around what is true. And in our church, there is that element to it, but it we also add a layer of, even if it's true, can it be said, right? That layer of carefulness, it's hard for evangelicals to understand. Mostly, they just don't have an equivalent dynamic to this. That's not a category they don't they don't have a category called sacred things you should keep private um if you think about the the things that we talk about in the temple right lots and lots and lots and most of them can be talked about outside of the temple and many people have very good reasons for not doing so right it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't make sense for evangelicals latter-day saints we clearly have a category called true things that are sacred that you should not be talking about. Um, we only quibble about what belongs in that category. We don't quibble if it is a category. I do want to take a minute here before we're done um, to talk about the Catholic perspective. It is not my area of research or specialty. If that's an interest, an area of interest for you, I would refer you to frequent fair speaker, Robert Boylan. Robert is a wonderful friend of mine. I learn so much from him and um, just frequently refer to him on lots of stuff that I don't know. Um, it, there is an interesting thing going on in Catholic theology that Latter-day Saints will find interesting. You are probably at least vaguely familiar with the idea that Mary, the mother of Jesus, has a special place in their theology. Exactly what her position is, that has also changed over the centuries, but her importance has never really gone away. Now, non-Catholics sometimes say that Catholics pray to Mary, and while that is sometimes true, it's probably more accurate to say that they are speaking to Mary and asking her to pray on their behalf. But she still has an incredibly important role because the presumption is that God will listen to her in a way that he might not listen to the one praying. Mary is also called in Catholic theology, sometimes the queen of heaven. Sometimes she's called the mother of God. And the reason I point this out to you is it reveals the same issue the evangelicals are trying to grapple with. They long for a heavenly mother. They can't quite work it out theologically either. If this topic comes up at all between you and your evangelical friends or family member, I suppose it would be a very fascinating conversation. Certainly there are some differences between our faith and their faith. I've detailed them for you in this video. But some of the some of the longing and the wishing that is in them that can't quite find a theology to land on, it's still there if you know how to see it and you know how to make some room for it. Well, there's a lot more here. We are out of time. We will pick this topic up another time. I think I had said this before, um, this video series is designed kind of in a spiral. We're going to hit um, the same topics a number of times and each time get a tiny bit deeper or different layer on them. So this will certainly come back up as we progress through the New Testament. And I look forward to bringing you more on this. Come back next time and we'll take up another topic. Thanks for listening.